I think, first of all, why we wrote this paper, um, this is really to answer an important question, which is, you know, I work in a bank and we don't see many transactions uh, related to BRI, although I have to say that very much depend, depends on how you define BRI. Um, I think I'll have to ask uh, a co-host to, I, I Right. Send yes. my presentation. Maybe could they, I could. Yeah. I, I yeah, could. Please. I could uh, share the screen for you. Yes. Uh, it doesn't allow me to share for some reason. Okay. So, thanks okay, very so much. Just, just tell her when you want her to advance to the next yes, slide. Yes. No worries. I'll do that. Okay. So why did we write this paper? Because we really wanted to see what the uh, role of Hong Kong could be more than actually is so far, because we knew it was limited. And, and this is because uh, the Belt and Road, as, as we know it so far, has been mainly led by Chinese companies and by policy banks in particular, financing Chinese companies' expansion abroad, whether for project finance and to a lesser extent, to a lesser extent, which is important, FDI. So we knew that was the background. But in a way, we also knew, as I mentioned before, that this had to change, that you can't think of a project of the size of a BRI financed only by Chinese banks domestically and, you know, and, and going abroad. Of course, this is uh, in itself narrow because we need to remember that part of the projects are financed by the host countries themselves. So, you know, the government say, of Pakistan could be raising funds, sovereign debt, to finance part of that project. But what we really wanted to pick up is companies that are operating in BRI uh, uh, geographies, whether they actually uh, use Hong Kong as opposed to Singapore, yeah, that, that offshore nature, to raise syndicated loans or bond finance or equity finance um, for the purpose of a project in the BRI space. That, that is really a very narrow uh, scope of what we want to do. But we think it's important because at the end of the day, for such a cross-country uh, project like the BRI, you can think of the very many opportunities for offshore centers to participate in such projects for the mere fact that they are cross-border projects. Yeah. So, so what's the scope so far? What's the comparison? And in which areas of these different types of financing does Hong Kong excel compared to Singapore? The numbers will still look small, let me tell you, because we are even excluding projects within the mainland. We're only looking at projects in the rest of the geographies of the BRI. And, and in, this, in this way, this is really the question we pose ourselves. So next, please. This is, by the way, joint work with Gary Ng and, and Henry Lee uh, at Hong Kong USD, Henry. So I, I thank both of them for for their help. So moving on, I'll do objectives and you know data and, and look at these markets, cross-border lending, bond financing, equity finance, and passive investment. Uh, the data is not great, I have to tell you, so don't expect major conclusions, but at least it's the first attempt to look at this topic. There's very little literature. It's, there's more about, as, as uh, Nicola said, what Hong Kong could do, which is surely enormous, but not so much as to what Hong Kong has so far done. That's what we try to do. Thank you, next. Next. Um, so again, the objective is to look at how important is cross-border financing, not necessarily overall financing. And within that, how relevant is Hong Kong? And comparing Song Hong Kong with Singapore, there's many other offshore centers in the world. We could think of London, Luxembourg, especially for passive investment. Are they relevant? The answer, is not really, it's mainly about Hong Kong and Singapore so far. Um, and again, these are the markets we cover, syndicated lending, cross-border bank lending, basically bond issuance, equity finance and passive financing. Next. So the data, and this is the headache. I mean, uh, I'm sure if, if you've tried to work on the financing, cross-border financing of BRI, you will realize that, that the data is very limited and also you need to uh, think of a very narrow definition to even pose the question, as I said. So, uh, 
First of all, we do not cover projects in the mainland. Not that we don't think they are BRI projects, but basically we're, we're looking at the cross-border nature of, the, of, 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 of this project. And that's the cross-border financing of this project. So that's the narrow scope of our exercise, as I explained. Then we, we take win and Bloomberg, but, uh, win data. Uh, for some, we need to look at you know, indi individual uh, deals to make sure that they are actually what we are uh, aiming at. So that's uh, wind data. But overall, more generally, especially for syndicated loans, Bloomberg data. And then we have flow of funds for the asset management part, for the passive, finan uh, passive financing. Uh, from the Securities and Futures Commission of Hong Kong and the Monetary Authority of Singapore. The time frame is it starts slightly before um, BRI, but you know there's hardly anything there. So it's from the beginning of the project to 2019. We also have some sectoral uh, stories for you, which projects say which sector is more relevant in Hong Kong as opposed to Singapore. And uh, we wish we could answer all of those questions for for every market we are following, um, but unfortunately, there's no data for everything. The, the best cover um, uh, instrument, financial instrument, is cross-border bank lending, syndicated loans, by which we can find the actual destination of that cross-border lending, the sector, the currency of the nomination, and the origin of the lender. So is it the Chinese bank or is it a European bank or you know foreign bank? Um, so that's where we can actually have a better story, at least more detailed. And I, I'll show you the, in a minute what are the conclusions. For bond issuance, we don't have the origin um, uh, because in a way there is no intermediary. It's just, um, well, there is an intermediary charging some fees, I have to tell you. Uh, Juicy wants to help somebody issue a bond, but but it's not of the same relevance, and thus we don't have that. And and the, and even more, we don't have that information. So we only look at the destination. So even there, you know, we assume that if the company is raising funds, it's the destination. That's even not necessarily the case. So for bond issuance, in other words, it's very hard to, to know whether the money is raised for the for the country of of this, for which destination is raised. Um, sector generally there is information about the sector uh, for so so it's about the country raising, uh, sorry the company raising the sector of the company raising and we assume it's the same sector they are investing which again might not be the case and of course the currency is known so only the currency in in my view is certainly well known but the rest is we're making these big assumptions for equity finance and asset management we only know the destination. So as you see, you know, we as we move on, the the amount of information is is less and less. Next. Uh, so we focus on the best uh, we have, which is the cross border lending, syndicated loans. So what do we find? Um, and again, remember this is a bottom up data. So we have all of these transactions which we pile up together to to gather some conclusions for you. The first one is that it's all about Hong Kong and Singapore. And again, what are we measuring here? So if, if an, a company X, it could be Sinopec because we do include Chinese companies, obviously, um, borrows to invest in Indonesia and borrows from you know a group of banks or a single bank for that matter, um, because we also pulled that together. So that's what we have here. Um, Singapore looks slightly bigger for that 2011 to 19, which is what I'm covering, as you see. Um, um, but there's two ways to look at this. One is the value of the transaction, so the amount of, um, of the value of the syndicated lending, which has happened based in Singapore, I mean, for banks based in Singapore, they don't need to be Singaporean banks. As I mentioned, this is an offshore center, uh, into BRI. Uh, the blue, uh, dark blue is BRI and the rest is non-BRI. So for the value, uh, it, it's, it's slightly bigger for Singapore, but not much, much bigger. This is actually surprising because Hong Kong is a bigger syndicated uh, lending market. So, so in a way, 
the, the answer is, I guess everybody realizes, it's because of Singapore's role in, the, in ASEAN, which is a major region of, you know, transactions, funding of BRI projects. Um, for number of deals, Singapore stands out like three to four times. So meaning Singapore is first of all bigger overall. Second, it deals with smaller uh, syndicated deals than Hong Kong. And I think this is because of the granularity and capillarity of Singapore's financing role in ASEAN, which Hong Kong has not managed to replicate. And I think that's why I was asking the question about FTA, Southeast Asia, because the question is, would that help? Because maybe you need to, to have that real economy uh, inter, interlinkage to get to a, um, a bigger uh, financing from Hong Kong into BRI. It might not be enough to just uh, transact. And I think uh, Nicholas was in a way uh, hinting at this idea that it's also about Hong Kong companies themselves and what they can do, etc. Next. Um, now, how this is over time because I only showed you from you know the beginning to the end of a project, and as you see, of course, the project has uh, spiked in in 2015 for an in in. In Singapore and Hong Kong, but you can see there that sometimes there's like a big deal. Uh, in the case of Hong Kong, M, uh, MGM uh, China uh, Holdings, which is 40 45 percent of that spike in 2015, and then it comes down. So you can see from the graph that there has not been like a, a massive increase in syndicated lending from Hong Kong or even Singapore to a lesser extent into BRI geographies. And, and again, is it because China was doing it all? Or was it too costly for banks to lend there? Think about regulatory requirements, you know, for high, uh, high risk, or maybe some may not be even investment grade countries. That might be a constraint. But the point is, you see here that we are far from what is really needed in terms of, of billions of US dollars. It's very, very, very small compared to total financing of BRI projects. Next. Um, so again, you can see there that for within BRI, the bulk of the transactions are uh, ASEAN for Singapore. Next. And, and that shows in the concentration. So in other words, if, imagine for whatever reason, relations um, between the mainland and, and ASEAN were to deteriorate, we can think of many reasons, by the way, but I won't get into that. Uh, Singapore has a much higher risk because of its concentration. Of So one thing to think about for Hong Kong as a, you know, I'm not a policy maker, but if, if it helps Nicholas and others, is in a way to go beyond ASEAN because that's where the, the where nothing is really covered so far. Uh, and I think that's something important in terms of, of uh, uh, financial services, um, uh, uh, agreements, et cetera. Next. Uh, so perhaps the, the end result of this, of what I showed you is that really um, Hong Kong is not really capturing, if, if I may say so, it's, it's um, geographical or even natural role of, uh, of the key cross-border offshore center to help China uh, um, finance this massive project. And in fact, most of what's happening is actually mainland uh, China um, originated loans, uh, however, financed in Hong Kong. So it's not really about other companies. It's not a company from Pakistan coming to uh, borrow from Hong Kong offshore center. It's, it's about China itself. In Singapore, this is different. There are companies from the BRI. So maybe this is an important lesson that, that to go beyond um, those Chinese companies that may, however, still find easy financing. As I said, I think this is harder and harder, but 
from the mainland. So go to the other side of the transaction within the BRI. Next, as Singapore has been doing, as you see in the graph, is is a lot is local market. Go uh, next. So in other words, Singapore is about Singaporean companies. Hong Kong is mainly about Chinese companies. That's that uh, meaning mainland companies. So that's a little bit the key difference. Um, so for Singapore, it's more of a real economy type financing, their own companies financing, you know, their expansion. For Hong Kong, it's really about intermediation of Chinese, um, of mainland companies. So that's the key uh, difference. Sectoral composition. So you see here that is mainly consumer, uh, fi uh, consumer and financial. Uh, so imagine China Development Bank issuing uh, for a project to find you know to finance a project in a BRI geography so it's about Chinese banks using Hong Kong to then finance BRI um, and in the case of uh, Singapore there is more sectors you can see that all the financials are important but you can see consumer is much bigger than for Hong Kong and then uh, energy is very big so it's a little bit different. You can see the, the stint of the real economy in the Singaporean sectoral data, which you don't see as clearly in Hong Kong. Next. Currency. So I think quite interesting uh, to see that no matter what we read, there's hardly any use of uh, renminbi in BRI loans, either in Singapore or in Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, yes, however, in Hong Kong, the currency of diversity, so the, the diversification is bigger than in Singapore. So you have Euro, for example, you have even Hong Kong dollar, uh, 10%, which is interesting. Um, and uh, US dollar only 58%. In Singapore is 91%. Um, and uh, as I said, the, the renminbi is basically non, non, non-existent. It's very, very small. Uh, the degree of diversification of currencies, I think that's quite interesting. In Hong Kong, is as big for BRI than non-BRI. So you could think that it could be bigger for developed countries, which may accept, you know, uh, a euro-denominated uh, loans because maybe you know it's a European company uh, uh, or. Fin financing a project in Europe. No, the same happens within BRI. And I think that's quite interesting. Hong Kong seems to have managed to diversify uh, the currency denomination of uh, cross-border lending much more than Singapore, even uh, for high risk or higher risk uh, economies within the BRI. Next. Um, and, and in, even more interesting to me, frankly speaking, is that who is lending? Are there Chinese banks or mainland banks uh, domiciled in Hong Kong? Um, by the way, I have to say something important. Mm, if uh, we're talking about a big subsidiary, it would look like a Hong Kong bank. I mean, we're talking here about branches when we talk about foreign uh, foreign uh, foreign banks. So those branches of foreign banks are actually larger in terms of, um, uh, I mean, the growth, in other words, um, the growth of their lending, especially since 2017, is bigger uh, than Chinese banks. Um, uh, and then the the share, if I may say, classification of of the actual loans is forty percent for foreign banks and sixty percent for Chinese banks. Um, it, that includes Hong Kong banks. Uh, but the, it seems like they're bigger, but uh, the growth is not so much there as for uh, foreign branches in Hong Kong, which seem to be readier to take that risk. This might be because Chinese banks are already lending uh, in the mainland, so that might be too much of a concentration of risk. I don't really know. Next one. Alicia, you may try to finish up soon, please. Yes, yes, I will. Uh, next one then. I will, I have, uh, the good thing is the data is so bad for the rest that, you know, I'm 
kind of happy, Albert, that I need to finish soon. Next one. Um, we'll move to bond financing. And here, what you can see very obviously is that offshore, the, the use of Hong Kong's offshore uh, nature for bond financing, mainly dollar, the renminbi market is very small, as you know, especially now that in some bond market, it's all about mainland Chinese companies. They're them getting the dollars from Hong Kong offshore center and then investing in BRI geographies. Uh, next one. This is of course not the case of Singapore as you may have seen already in, in, the, in the parallel graph. Now, this has indeed grown very substantially. So this is where the action is in bond financing. Okay, um, and you can see there South Korea, Philippines, you know, in an, South Korea, Philippines in particular, um, really uh, increasing the uh, using that this uh, asset destination. So companies raising funds to invest in these BRI economies from Hong Kong offshore center. Next. Uh, in Singapore, though, uh, the size is so much smaller. We're talking about one fourth. So for bond finance, that's where Hong Kong's role seems to be heading. And I think that's, that's quite important. And by the way, Singapore is all ASEAN and much, much smaller. Indonesia being the, the, the largest, but there is no su such thing as South Korea, etc. Next. And for the sectors, again, it's, it's about consumer and financials, uh, some government. So for Singapore, you could think of Sri Lanka sovereign, for example, meaning it's, it's, it's the case I, I mentioned before, Pakistani raising funds for themselves through a bond uh, issues. Pakistan is not there, but Sri Lanka is, as I mentioned, Indonesia as well, both in Singapore and Hong Kong. Uh, next. And US dollar dominates here very, very clearly. In, in Singapore though, the use of their own currency, Singapore dollar is, is, is quite apparent, is about 30%. So for syndicate loans, there is use of Euro, a little bit Hong Kong dollar, but not for bond finance. There is a massive dollar market. There's hardly anything left. Hong Kong is only 7% which compares very, very, uh, you know, clearly from uh, Alicia, Singapore. Can you wrap up, please, because I yes. Sure uh, next one. yes, yes, I will. Next one, equity finance, next. So again, it's all about mainland companies raising funds in Hong Kong. It's not about Hong Kong companies and in Singapore, it's their own company. So that's a big difference as well. Next. So this is equity finance to purchase, for example, a company in BRI, yeah? Next one, I'll, I'll follow Albert uh, orders very, very clearly. Next one, passive investment. Um, passive investment, the data is just very poor because uh, uh, for Hong Kong, we do have the data of Asia Pacific um, uh, and we have West and others, and we can compare with, with Singapore. So Asia Pacific is bigger in Hong Kong for passive finance. We're talking about asset management companies operating in Hong Kong where they invest. I think this is a massive opportunity for Hong Kong, even using, of course, the, the mutual recognition of funds with the mainland. So basically use Hong Kong as a platform for passive financing of BRI projects uh, and, and that being a major market for Hong Kong, next. But the size so far is actually quite limited for uh, Asia. Next, I mean, the total amount of funds. Uh, so conclusions, Hong Kong is indeed very well placed. Nicola said it very clearly to occupy a central role to intermediate overseas funds into BRI related projects especially in my opinion, asset management, uh, so passive financing, because that can compete easily with the mainland's own financing as it doesn't require any type of control or, or specific knowledge of a project, which is partially why a li very little is financed cross border, as opposed to you know, a Chinese bank financing a Chinese company for a specific project. So the, the fact that passive financing doesn't require so much information, I think is a key thing to develop. And for the rest, most of the action 
uh, for Singapore is syndicated loans, for Hong Kong is uh, bond financing. So that's what we have, but much more could be done. I mean, the key message of this presentation is that for the size of BRI, there's a long way to go for Hong Kong, given its, its natural advantage. So that's all from my side and uh, happy to take questions. Thank you. Um, we have one question from the uh, attendees. Um, does the attempts to promote renminbi internationalization affect the potential role of Hong Kong versus Singapore in financing BRI projects? Well, uh, we recently published uh, our annual report kind of tracking the use of uh, renminbi overseas. So, uh, and it is very obvious that Hong Kong remains the largest, um, although, it, you know, there's been an obvious, there's been a reduction since 2015 of the international use of the renminbi. Um, but that it's spiking up again. And that embryonic, if I may say, uh, recovery is all about Hong Kong. So, so Hong Kong relative role for renminbi financing is clearly there because the deposit base has increased more than in the rest of other cross-border um, renminbi centers. However, as I was trying to explain, the, 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 the role of renminbi for either syndicated lending or even bond issuance, cross-border uh, bond issuance for BRI projects is still close to nil. So anything that is increasing is really settlements or you know trade, uh, hardly anything on FDI or or project finance. So that uh, as I explained, so I think there's a long way to go before we see this development. And I had one last question: When you talk about passive finance, you mean like an asset manager in Hong Kong raises yeah. equity from wherever and then does like private equity investments in these Belt and Road countries, that kind of thing? Yes. Or yeah, it could be private equity, it could be private debt, it could be just simple, you know, a, a fund, uh, BRI dedicated. But for that, of course, more projects have to be market-based because if the projects are not readily available and they're financed bilaterally right. they by CDB, into, then there's no market because there's no projects to, to, to act acquire assets from. And I think that's the key reason why we don't see more uh, passive financing. Not that there wouldn't be any interest. I think the key issue is that there are no projects on which to invest, real assets on which to invest. Yeah. Thank you. 